en nebo kokwet ab Jesone en betut ne inegei kimitei ak toot em nebo biomedical engineering en Kenyatta University Stella Chelagat ko kimeje ke taja kokwet tool and i think for the sake of diversity that this program is bringing today what i will do is to switch to english but i can obviously say chamge stella um uh, please, again, missing. yeah welcome um, to to the program today we have a very mixed uh, group of people so um I think for fairness and to allow everybody to participate in this program, uh, in this very unique program, we are going to have to um, do it in, in English. Um, I, I wish to invite everybody who is uh, currently uh, following the show on Facebook. This show comes to you live. I am in Germany. Serone Rapcherule is uh, my, the easiest of my names. Jason is, is actually the surname. Um, I come from Nandi Hills. But I live with my family in Germany, where I work for Mars Incorporated. Um, and, and those of you who are in Kenya, you know Wrigley, the chewing gum business that belongs to Mars. Um, I am joined today privileged to be joined today by Stella uh, Jelagat, who is going to introduce herself. We have on the other side, somebody who is going to join us briefly, June Chepkeme, um, because we are talking about uh, the innovations at our universities and the role of girls in STEM or science and technology, engineering and mathematics. And Stella is one of those girls that has made a major breakthrough um, in employing the environment that is available in Kenya to innovate um, in the context of solving a problem for COVID-19. So I think it's a, a great opportunity for us to really talk to a girl, a young girl um, who has used with her colleagues, and I think we need to under, underline this, that it's not about Stella, it's about Stella collaborating with others to innovate and provide a solution to a problem. And she's going to tell us um, in detail about that. We are also going to hear the challenges that people go through when they innovate in Kenya and potentially the solutions that we, we could get out there. And I mean, if you think about it, um, innovation is is not a very um, it's not a very um, it's it's not a very easy thing to do. Uh, neither is it a very difficult thing to do. There are um, economies that encourage uh, innovation. Israel is one of them. Israel is called in the world is is known as the startup nation because they say out of a very uh, small population of 8.5 million people. Um, you could easily count an innovation in Israel for every 1,400 people. Um, that, that is how innovative they are. And, and part of that is coming from a government that supports innovation, is coming from a culture at university that doesn't look at the lecturer as a small god, is coming from a student and innovator's mind, which is keen on providing uh, solutions to everyday problems. And it doesn't need to be a very complex thing like inventing uh, you know, the next uh, vehicle to go to space. It could also be something as simple as um, you know, how to make Ugali. You can imagine, you and I grew up uh, I mean, I'm over 50 now, and the way we make Ugali today is still the same way we made it uh, when I was born. And yet there are innovations that we see every day coming up. So I think this is something that we really want to underline in today's talk is the struggles that you go through as girls, first to study science, uh, technology, engineering, and maths, and secondly, to innovate as a student 
to be able to overcome that fear, get the support that you, you require, and, and get the breakthrough uh, to put your idea um, on, on the table. Uh, I am lucky that I work in the private sector and my private sector employer is, is uh, very keen on encouraging innovation. And, and you know, Germany as a, as a country also helps by, I mean, they passed laws that say whatever I invent doesn't belong to my employer. My employer has to negotiate with me and, and I, get, I get paid um, for that as well. Um, I also wish to welcome, we are being joined by, uh, by Stella's mother. So this is a, quite a great opportunity um, that we have the daughter and, and the mother joining us. Stella, so much about me. This is not about me today. This is about you and, and your story. Can you tell us in, in brief, who is Stella? And, and then take us through your journey through, you know, you were born, you went to school, um, where did you go to school so that you have that connection with the girls that, that went to school with you, if you went to a girls' school? Stella Jelaga. Thank you so much for having me in this show. Yeah. Uh, when, as you have heard, my name is Stella Chalagat. I'm a, currently I'm a fourth year student, a hey. medical engineering student hey. at Kenyatta hey. University. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Now about my background, yeah. uh, I was born in I was born in Eldoret, Wasingesha County, in particular Tarbo. But I I schooled I still schooled in Eldoret. I went to a school called SOS where I did my KC until I did my KCP in back in twenty eleven, I think so. I did my KCP, I got uh, three hundred and ninety eight marks. Then I went far to high school. I joined high school in 2012, I joined high school called Sacho High School, Baringo County, where I studied there for four years until I did my KCSE in 2015. I scored an A in my exams. Then um, now there was a question of the question of what what career do I want? What do I aspire to be? What what would I want to be? Now having an A, I got I got an A of 81. I did splendid in my sciences and my mathematics. I did three sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics. And I scored an A in all of them. I also scored an A in mathematics. So I that was then I realized that I was actually fit for an engineering course because I was good in sciences and maths. I applied for biomedical engineering course in Kenyatta University. At the time, it was the only course offered in Kenya. And um, I knew that I could handle engineering. So I joined the university, Kenyatta University in 2016, September. I did first year in uh, engineering. It wasn't so bad. Then yeah. I continued until Stella, now, I'm in my fourth year. Stella, I think, you know, a f super fantastic record. If you think about it, you know, you've come from um, a rural area um, in, in Tarbo, went through uh, primary school, SOS, and then Sacho High School, and you got an A. I'd like us to pause there um, just to recognize. So June has joined us. Um, let's, let's go to June. Um, because I'd like us to also invite June to tell us about herself briefly. Uh, June started off her career, I do not want to spoil it from very far, and now she's looking up to something that is coming up next. Um, I have seen a number of people that want to join the uh, Skype call. I'd like to restrict it for now to only um, Stella, the, you know, her mother, Bilha, and, and, and June and myself. The rest of you can watch us on on you on um, on on Facebook. If you go to my page, uh, Serone Jason, um, click share and then start a watch party, and you can post it on your 
on your wall and then people can watch it there and let's watch together and encourage Stella and all the other girls who are out there. But Stella, just hold it for a moment because before you went to Kenyatta University, something else tremendous really happened in your life. You had an experience outside Kenya. And before we go there, I'd like us to welcome June. Um, June, tell us about yourself. Who is June Jitkeme? Where does she come from? Where were you born? I will not ask you the other question that I asked you yesterday. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, thank you very much. And of course, you have your show, June. I want us. I want you as well to mention the fact that you have your show and 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 where is it? And are you sharing this video on that show as well, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, thank you so so much for having me. When I joined, I knew I was going to be a co-host, but it looks like I've become a guest. And I, my sincere apologies. Technology has a way of messing you when you are ready for something. And sorry that I joined late. My name is June Chepkeme. I was born in um, a village called Kablamayua and Tadasis in Tindiret, Nandi County, um, uh, just about uh, over 30 years ago. Um, number seven in a family of eight, born to um, ordinary Kalenjin man and woman. None of my parents really went to school. Uh, my father worked as a casual laborer in the nearby factory that is not very far from our home. That is Chemelil uh, Sugar. And at the age of eight, I joined him in Chemelil, um, where I lived with him as I schooled at a Chemelil factory primary school, as a public primary school. Um, after my high school in uh, early 2000, I joined uh, primary school. I joined high school in uh, early 2000. Immediately, I graduated from high school. Um, if you all recall what was happening um, after, uh, when the government changed and uh, the economy was going through its transformation, a bit of structuring and all that, my father was returned um, from Chemelil, and therefore um, it went, we all went back, and that was a really difficult time for us as a family, and we were struggling with school fees. So I came to Nairobi in the year 2005 after high school, where I started off by vending um, vegetables in Kibera. That's one thing that professor doesn't know about me. <laughs> so I used to sell um, boga. Uh, I would wake up at around 3 a.m. and go to Gikomba market to buy vegetables and sell. And that's how I raised my first college uh, fees. That, that was between February and uh, June, no, actually April of 2005. I really wanted to study journalism at that time as I was waiting to get admission to college. Um, none of my parents or my, my siblings really wanted me to be a journalist. So I sponsored myself to study a diploma in journalism, uh, courtesy of my vegetable vending business. That's why I raised my school fees and I worked uh, between, I went to school between April and, um, and, and, and around August of the same year. Um, in between that, I got an internship um, as a, at a radio station called Biblia Osema Broadcasting, where I only, Stay there for about three months before I got a job at CAS uh, FM. I was actually hired directly. So I would usually say that I got a job direct from high school because I, I honestly had no papers. I was humped with my um, certificate that I had had in high school where I used to participate in extracurricular activities, especially arts. Um, I, was a, I was very good with poetry. Um, and public speaking. So that's what added me a job. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to stress extracurricular activities for, for, for kids wherever possible. Um, then I continued with my um, diploma in journalism. So I had to change. Now that I had a job, I had to change to, uh, I closed my shop and I started selling other things that were a bit um, flexible to supplement uh, my income and pay my school fees. Uh, within no time, I joined a campus as a self-sponsored student. At that time, Moore University in 2006 had opened a branch in Nairobi. Uh, I had the basics of journalism, so I proceeded to do PR and communications, which I graduated in the year 2010, and it proceeded immediately for a master's in communication studies, and I graduated in 2012. Now, all that time, I had worked uh, um, at CAS 
media group where I'd cut my a niche for myself as um, a, a business journalist who has headed the business news desk. And I also had the privilege to host serious programs where I first met Professor um, when I was hosting a show called Ikwengandoi, the first crop of governors, those who, who were able to make it pass through my hands <laughs> and those who attempted and, and still made it to this far. Um, I was honored to host Professor. Um, around that time, I was ready to now move from media to corporate communications. I applied for a job. And the day of my graduation, after going through a series of interviews with Safaricom, I think I had done five interview sessions, I received a, a phone call at the graduation square that I needed to meet the late Bob Colimo, the CEO of Safaricom. I abandoned my graduation and I came back to Nairobi. And that is the day I got hired and I joined Safaricom in 2015 uh, to manage PR. Um, I worked there for... Um, a few years before government came calling, um, was asked to join government to support the establishment of a new city that is called Konza Technopolis. Um, when I joined Konza, I was uh, hired to manage, again, co communications, but the project was not ready for communications. So I involved myself in a new, what you call brand assets. So I pioneered a program that is currently uh, supporting innovators. It's called the Konza Innovation Ecosystem Initiative. And I was also lucky to be appointed at that time by the cabinet secretary in charge of education, uh, Dr. Fred Matiangi, to coordinate uh, the establishment of a university of strategic national importance. It is called Kenya Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. It's purely a, um, as a, an engineering um, university. And I, um, I was privileged to be part of the team that has put together curriculum while coordinating that will train the new crop of engineers at postgraduate level. I'm still coordinating that project. The curriculum is almost complete. We are doing the infrastructure, uh, the brick and mortar aspect of that. And beyond that, I do, I do investment promotion. Working in government has exposed me to um, um, investment promotion. I've been to over, I think, 15 countries, different continents, of, as far as Russia, Germany, Israel, United States, just uh, but to name a few, uh, where I've been able to sit at the forefront and the, the tables to discuss aspects of investment. And therefore, um, recently when the country, the entire world was faced with the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, I asked myself a difficult question as a Kenyan, as a citizen, what is my contributor, contribution to, to my country? And I realized that this is the only opportunity to celebrate the good things that emerges in every crisis. What I did mention is that I did uh, a research on, on crisis management and I realized that behind every crisis there is always a um, success story. And therefore, I am running a program called Junche Keme Special. It's my YouTube channel where I celebrate innovators, enterprises, and, and entrepreneurs who are actually um, thriving despite the pandemic. I'm trying to summarize, Professor. Uh, besides that, I am um, a PhD student um, locally, and I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, furthering uh, a further PhD abroad. That's really the, the, the shortest I, it can get. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, June. I mean, everybody is asking me today what's happening with Zerone. We've always heard him speak to us in our mother tongue. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you who are joining us from all over the world, from Nakuru, from Nairobi, from Eldred, from Qatar, from Dubai, from the US, from Kenya, from Rwanda. I see all of you. I see your comments. Thank you very much for finding time to join us in today's um, special meeting. You cannot believe what I have here. I have a heavyweight team of girls and ladies. Um, Five of them are joining me directly on Zoom. Um, and, and, and then we have, you know, tons of them that are watching on, on Facebook as well. And today we are basically doing one thing. We are talking about the role of a girl child in STEM. And we are looking with a very renewed focus at Stella Jelagat, a member of a 15 strong team of university students that innovated at bachelor's degree level. You know, you usually think about inventors as being these guys who studied all the way to PhD or that um, 
you know, study in very fancy universities abroad or, you know, work for very powerful companies, but that's not the case. Today we are looking at uh, humility uh, personified in the person of Stella and, um, you know, being able to identify a need and providing uh, innovation and driving some intellectual um, property. And Stella has given us a brief story about her life. She was born in Tarbo um, to, to Bilha, and I saw Bilha, but she's stepped out. Um, maybe Stella then can tell us briefly, why did you come to Germany between your Form 4 and joining Kenyatta University? Uh, Stella, and congratulations again, getting an A, a straight A, that is not a joke. As a father of a daughter, I'm thoroughly proud of that. Stella. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I got an A in KCSE. Mm -hmm. Then after that, my mother was in Germany. She was doing her PhD in chemistry in an institute called Helmholtz Institute in Leipzig, Germany. Mm -hmm. So she had already been there for like three, three years. She was almost finishing at the time. So she had promised me that when I finish my KCC, my phone call, she will take me there. So yeah, she she bought an air ticket. I got to the plane and I went to Germany to stay with her for that short way, for like six months. So during that time, I learned Germany. I went to a, I got a course. I learned Germany. I explored Germany. I saw how it was a great company. It was a manufacturing country. It had great things, good quality products, and uh, you can really see a great contrast between Germany and Kenya. So you wonder, what is this? What are these people doing that we're not doing? Why are they so advanced? Why is their technology so advanced? Everything of theirs looks good. You get to question yourself. So. Yeah, thank you very much, Stella. Did you have a bike when you were in Germany? I mean, I'm, I'm having a conversation today with people and I'm telling them it's, it's, not, it's not a status symbol to have a car. And, and you know, part of the reason is because it is a very expensive thing to maintain a car in a country like Germany. It's not an easy thing. And I know people have challenges in um, and, and going wherever. Um, I'd like anybody who is joining us, if you if you really want to be here on on on, um, okay, I I muted, um, and and I don't know you saw you saw how many people went around in bikes, uh, yeah, Stella, right? Yeah, yeah, there were so many. In fact, you you could hear so many cases of bikes being stolen and not even cars. So you wonder. Anyway, I didn't have a bike because I was afraid of riding one by then, but. There were so many and I, I could admire and wish that I had a bike, but the courage to ride a bike is another thing now. <laughs> but there are so many, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And, and so you are in Germany for eight months, isn't it? And, and why did you then not study in Germany? Why did you go back to Kenya? Well, I faced a couple of challenges. First was the language. I had to learn language for like until a level C1. Then the other thing is about finding a course that suits me. Uh, I wanted engineering courses and medicine courses, but I found it hard to get into those kind of courses because the, the fees was a bit high and they, it required me to do an extra two years of uh, courses that I, it's like an extension of my secondary education. So, but then I, I had applied in Kenya for the usual process that we apply for courses in university. I had applied for a course in biomedical engineering. So I, was, I came to a point where I have to decide, do I go to Kenya to do biomedical engineering or do I stay in Germany and do uh, an extra two years of prerequisite courses so that I can join a degree course in medicine or engineering. So. I came to a point that I had to decide where. So it, 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 at the time, it looked better for me to come and do an, an undergraduate degree in Kenya for five years. Then maybe then I can now get more opportunities to do masters outside the outside Kenya. And mm -hmm. then it got me that now that I've visited Germany, I've seen how it looks like. I've seen the education. I've seen their facilities. It's, they had great 
in universities and facilities. So I said to myself, maybe I can come and do a five year long course in engineering, then I can come there and now specialize on what I really want to do. Yeah, very good. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Stella. I mean, I, I always tell people that uh, in, in Germany, education is free. It, you don't pay school fees like you do in, in the US, it's free. The only difficulty is most of the best courses, the, the ones that you would require uh, for professional um, you know, study in Germany are offered in German. And like you said, you need to have proficiency level at this, the level of what is called a C1 or uh, um, sort of mother tongue uh, level of, of, of language skills. But then as you move on to masters, you have about 50, 50 to 75 percent of the courses can be covered in English and PhD is obviously um, covered is, uh, in, in, in English. OK, fantastic. June, I don't know. Do you have anything? Because I mean, we've taken Stella from from birth through high school, uh, primary school at SOS High School at Sacho. Um, she's gone to Germany and now she's ready to go back to, uh, to, to join university in, in, in Kenya. I might just add, because until now we haven't, I haven't mentioned this. I spoke to, to her mother today in the morning. Um, and, and June, uh, I don't know whether you knew that Stella is, is actually, um, she's related to the late uh, William Siner, who was an MP of Eldred North. Uh, so the uh, the mother, the mother is the daughter of Peter, who was the brother of William Siner, um, and, and I guess that's why she was probably born in Tarbo because Peter grew up, I mean, lived in Tarbo um, as as a family. So even though today is nothing to do with Talai, uh, the truth is she has Talai blood in in her. Um, but we are not proud of her because she's Talai. We, we are proud of her because here is an incredible girl who went through high school, um, has a very intelligent mother who has gone all the way to a PhD, but didn't just sit there and say, oh, you know, I want to sit around and just enjoy my mother's, uh, you know, fame um, and, 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 and waste time. She went and defined herself and Stella is defining Stella in a unique way um, without basically sitting on, on her laurels um, as it were. So Stella, you, I mean, June, if you have anything just, just uh, well, to add. Yeah. So I think for me, I would like to understand what shaped um, um, her thinking toward pursuing engineering and, uh, and medical related, related courses. What is it that happens between a high school to actually making a, a career decision? What was the motivation, Stella? Yeah, as I said, um, throughout high school, I was good in sciences and maths. I did three sciences. I did, uh, I did chemistry, I did physics, and I did biology. And I scored A in all of them in my KCAC. And I also scored an A in maths. I was a bit weak in languages. So I sat down with my mother and uh, she told me, if you are really good in this, uh, subjects, then if you go to a course that that includes all these subjects, all that all that you are shining in, you will find it easier and the, the course enjoyable. So engineering fits best with those kind of subjects with physics and maths. So, so yeah, she told me. You're combining your strength in, in, in sciences and mathematics and you're getting a mentor in your mother. Tell us about yeah. that mentorship that came from your mother. And how is important is mentorship in terms of career Well, my mother, if I can talk about her history, she was a high school teacher. I, in a, I don't know, St Stella, just, just to be clear, because June, you are not very audible. Um, can, you, can you repeat the question with a bit of uh, energy? And you know, I have, I have milk here, so I'd advise you to also have a glass of milk. June, repeat the question again. All right, so um, this, uh, from the explanation uh, that I'm getting from Stella is that her strength in sciences and mentorship from her mother played an, an important role in shaping her decision to pick a career of, that she best suits her. I would like to understand the role of mentorship in career choices because uh, we believe that this is a session to just encourage uh, both 
active, both parents, mentors, and, and the young people. Okay. Um, as I was saying, uh, my mother used to be a high school teacher in uh, Kesses. There was a school behind Moore University in Kesses, and she used to teach chemistry and maths. So when I was a student, she was really like tough on my grades, and she would tell me, work hard on these subjects, what is it that is disturbing you? You should do this and this to get an A. So she really played a big part in mentoring me, even through high school, and uh, always keeping up with my grades. If, if I fail, she knows the reason why, because she's already a teacher. She did a lot in uh, mentoring me and encouraging me and telling me how you should you should always succeed in education. She used to tell me that if you really want to better your life, don't look at what I have. You look at what you have. You have education and you have a, an intelligent mind. So use that opportunity. So she really played an important role in mentoring me until I, I am where I am right now. All right. So you joined University Stella and uh, within a very short time in first year, you managed to get into a team of innovators. Take us through the, the, the team. How did you get into that space? Oh yeah, as I said, I, uh, I applied for biomedical engineering course. Then I got admitted to the university, Kenyatta University in 2016, September. I joined uh, my class. Biomedical engineering, we are not really that many at the time. We were only like 40 students in, a, in my class. Yeah, so usually the first time is always difficult because I was in Nairobi. I knew no one in Nairobi. I've now been thrown into this environment where you have to interact with new people, no friends at all. So um, my first year was a bit difficult trying to fit in with all the changing environment, but I got to adjust and uh, know my purpose in, in the university. What is it that I want to get out of here? I'm here for a period of time. What is it that I'm supposed to achieve in that period of five years in my university? So you get your goals aligned, you get your priorities straight, and you start working on it. So I did my first year, second year, until I've been here for four years. I've been in university for four years. And well, still struggling with studies, yeah. Okay, so you, you've mentioned a very key important aspect of you setting the goals and uh, mapping out your priorities. Sorry? You've, you've mentioned, um, you know, setting your goals and mapping out your priorities as a student in campus. Um, yeah. Most startups, um, successful companies were actually born in campus. Did that influence uh, your, your choices in terms of thinking through those solutions that gave birth to this great innovation that is now synonymous with Kenyatta University? Um, now, when I picked biomedical engineering, you can see if you Google it, it says uh, you study a course that will help you, it, that will enable you to make and produce and design machines that will help people in hospital or help life in general. So you can, I sat down and start thinking, in Kenya there are no manufacturing companies that manufacture medical machines, yet I'm learning a course that's supposed to help me design a machine. And when you look at the current market for biomedical engineering, you go work in a company that supplies medical devices or do do servicing to medical devices or you go to a hospital and and uh, be the one servicing medical devices there. So I sat down and started thinking, what is it that I'm really doing with my course if it's meant to help me design? So it's, it was really a challenge because if I start, if I start thinking now that I am supposed to finish this course and design machines, so it comes as a challenge that there are no manufacturing companies. I have to be, the, if I want to design a machine, I can, I have to do it now on my own and being the first, maybe the first person to try manufacture a medical device in Kenya. Okay. Um, as I grab my cup of milk, I'd like to take it back to professor. And probably when I come back, I'd really like to understand the process of, of innovating in ideation.
Professor, you're on mute. Oh my God, thanks. Um, Stella, you, you encapsulated very well on, on, you know, the journey that you go through um, and, and thinking around, you know, problem solving. I think this is the key message, isn't it? You, you, you always want to think about innovation is a problem solving uh, effort. The only difference between um, innovating where you protect that innovation and innovating for the sake of it is somebody who protects it is aware of the need for that innovation to be exploited, you know, to be turned into something that can generate income so that your idea um, moves away from being an idea on paper to being an idea that is in a product on a shelf, um, so to speak. And I think this is one of the challenges, um, of, of the many challenges that we, 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 we you know, we encounter, N not just as scientists, but also as, as people from a country like Kenya, where sometimes a choice has to be made between putting food on the table and putting a scientist on the path to, to innovation, um, which is rather strange because June will tell you, we live in a knowledge economy and a knowledge economy cannot be fed on anything else. It cannot be fed on bad politics. It cannot be fed on, on uh, you know, um, stale knowledge. It cannot be fed on textbook information. It has to be fed almost um, literally on um, RSS feeds, so to speak. Yeah? It, it's real time, real time information. And that's why I get worried sometimes when I go to Kenya and I visit universities and I see lecturers still go to class with textbooks. If you see, a, if your lecturer still comes to class with, with you know, a, a textbooks rather than a sheaf of papers, then there is a problem because textbook knowledge is as old as it has been. It's, it's that knowledge is evolving every day. We need textbooks for fundamentals. There is no kidding about it. But if we want to innovate, we want to change something that has been changed, then we need current information and access to that um, makes the difference between innovating um, and, and being a supermarket economy, which is what we are basically um, currently are, isn't it, June? Um, just before I let you uh, answer, I, I have comments, you know, very powerful comments coming in from um, you know, people, Osea says, June is a very powerful uh, lady. I don't know, you, you look like you're earning another name, June, as, uh, as, as, uh, as Carnet. I, I told you, yes, was it yesterday or the day before, that we are going to give you another name called Langok. Uh, I, I mean, you come from Gab Langok, eh? around, around Tindre there. Uh, David Shelle says he's tuned in from Mombasa. Rosemary Tipis says, I am very proud of our girls, way to go. Um, Kiposke Joffrey Manyuri is tuned in from Mogadishu. You can imagine, uh, that, that's how far people are coming in. Blagadara Pueji is following from Nanyuki. Um, those are the people who are following from the, uh, from the page. And then I have people who are directly commenting on my profile. And what are they saying? And I mean, you can also access the uh, comments from your watch party, isn't it? Uh, Alfred is, is tuned in from um, Australia and he says Salimia Mugemi. Um, we have a guest all the way from Gapkiringon in, in, in Kabiyat. He's saying, I to go with up. Jason Ragamos or Ragapsa, you got to watch video. Netich Antosh Nikondani. Mary Kerit says, very inspiring story, Stella. William Munai, uh, he was a former Gapsuit boy, he says, I'm in the program. Uh, uh, Julie Betty Dudley says, as I look at you, Mary June, you are a very strong lady, keep it up. Jake Jebariot, we've seen your wave, Robert Kimaru as well. Kisorio um, Kibe. So Kisorio Kibe is, um, is, 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 is an IP lawyer. Uh, when, when I, yeah, Kisorio Kibe. So if, if, you, if you think about, you want to protect your innovation, um, these are the kind of people that we need. 
and and he was doing some piece of work for me the other day because I needed to I needed to patent the name synonym that we are using for for the company, and it's not it's not a very cheap uh, thing. It's it's going into uh, quite some handsome amount of money. Um, so these are some of the people that you need to talk to. Professor, uh, I'd like to comment about uh, patenting I, when, mm -hmm. when, when you get time after you finish the... Yeah, 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 sure. Um, Lorna Jepto, uh, Lorna Jepto says, thank you very much. Uh, Julie Betty Doodley, again, go for it, Jepto, you know, go for it. I, I like that spirit. Lorna Jepto says, Mose Jeva Arab Teta, Pole Pole. Where? Lorna, Ripke. Ilengia mete te tangnandi ilo me le kia kuri oja mani. Obadia Mandago says, brilliant, keep it up. Link with standard body for traceability purposes. And I think you will you will comment about the um, the part that KEBS has played in, in, in this, if it has been uh, certified, isn't it? Abdel Weldon is following us from Don Home. Thomas Arapko Yogi, this is the best motivation ever, keep it up. And you know, Arapko Yogi is also from uh, the Talai community as well. So, Oraju Sagari Yogi. Good work, Professor. I wish you had gotten the governor's seat. Sorry, uh, there is no problem. Whoever is on the seat at the moment is capable. And, and I retired from politics. I'm doing a fantastic job in science. I don't want to, to uh, overemphasize that. Salim, brilliant. Thanks so much for such inspiration from Doha in Qatar. Um, you know, people are tuned in from all over. Um, and, and, and following this. And I think as, as we were talking about Stella, I think June was going to ask you, can you take us through the step-by-step -step on how did the idea come up to innovate? And, and then how did you bring yourselves together, the 15 of you to talk about it? And then did you fail? And, and I, I do not want us to cheat ourselves. I mean, I, I am an innovator myself. I have I have 10 patents to my name, um, of course supported by a great company that, that I work for. And, and in some of them, I have failed miserably before I got it. And, and I think we need not be afraid of failure. This is the big problem that we have sometimes, um, that we are afraid of failure. We shouldn't be afraid of failure. The only mistake we make is if we don't learn anything out of failure, then that is wasted. But if we learn something, then we learn how not to do it. And I mean, you think about the guy who invented the electric bulb. He failed a thousand times. And what was the answer when he was told later about failing a thousand times? He said, I never failed. I found a thousand ways that don't work. Incredible. Yeah. So take us through the journey. How did the idea come up? How did you, how did you, um, you know, summon yourself, sat together and done, uh, did the continuous prototyping. Did you fail? Did you improve on an idea that failed? What learnings did you pick? And what are you teaching the rest of the people who are trying to innovate? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Christy Mwere, I see you're trying to join us on, on Zoom. I am afraid I'm not going to allow anybody on Zoom. Please join us on Facebook. You will be able to watch from there. Um, so that we keep a bit of discipline on the messaging here for the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Stella. Testa and June, if you want to add anything, just feel free to step in. Okay. Um, I don't know where to start. Should I start with the team or the ideation process? <laughs> it's your call. It's your call. Just order it the way you want and, you know, take it like that. It's okay. Maybe we'd like to know what came first. Uh, I think it's it's more the ideation than the team dynamics, or you form the team, then you were you confronted by a problem, then you start to think through a solution, or how did the, the process start? Oh yeah, I'll start with the team. Uh, we were a group of students from engineering school. We had formed a group last year. It's a, it was an, uh, like an affiliation to a society. It's called Atripoli. It's the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, Engineers. It is a professional body for engineers all over the world. So it has an allowance for student membership. So last year we formed a group. We did a lot of workshops. We did a lot of training and bringing people, engineering students together and learning new things, the current trends in engineer, engineering, in the engineering world. So 
we were holding workshops and then the university closed because of the COVID pandemic that was announced. That was late in March. So we went home. Now, they were watching, like I was uh, watching news. Uh, you see, now at the time, COVID pandemic was so new to Kenya. We only have like two, three cases. So we were watching news about other parts of the world who were seriously affected by the COVID pandemic. And you see one problem coming up, a challenge com that, that they are facing coming up, that is the shortage of mechanical ventilators. So for me, I thought I'm a biomedical engineering student. My course is about medical machines and designing many, many, I mean, medical machines to help treat patients in hospital. So I had done my attachment um, last year, around July to August in Kenyatta National Hospital, where I got to interact with various machines in the hospital, like X-ray, uh, CT scan, ventilators. I had a whole week in the working in the ICU, managing the ventilators there. So I thought myself, if this is a problem that the first world countries are facing shortage of mechanical ventilator then is, is bound to hit us very soon that we'll need more mechanical ventilators in our hospital seeing that the IC, ICU capacities in the hospitals in Kenya are very few the, that problem is bound to come so I said myself I have been studying biomedical engineering for four years I've done attachment in a hospital I know how it works I know the principles of its operation so back to the group of IEEE students. So you see the ventilator is very dynamic. You need, it's an electromechanical device. So if you think by yourself, I want to make a ventilator. Of course, I know the basics of it's working, but I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid I, can I really do it? There are things that would have challenged me in making the ventilator. So. In that group of uh, the students from my Tripoli, so somebody said, why don't we make a, a ventilator? And that really now uh, answered my question. Yes, I said, yes, we make a ventilator. We formed a group, another WhatsApp group about ventilator. We start uh, putting ideas, saying we can do this, we can do that. We start grouping ourselves. We did the design. There's the electrical design and there's the mechanical design. Now, me as a biomedical engineer student, I only know of electrical, electrical engineering. I don't, I don't know nothing of mechanical engineering. So we had to borrow mechanical from the mechanical engineering students. They are expertise in mechanical knowledge because I had none of it. They had to collaborate. The biomedical engineers, electrical engineers, and uh, mechanical engineering students. So we came up with this thing. We did the design. We did the coding. Now, after doing that, now it came to a question, we now have the designs. How do we start making it? How do we make it real? We only have the designs in our computer. We don't have the real thing. So at the time we were at home, now we are thinking, how, how can we make it happen? We, I tried to reach out to a couple of companies. I tried to reach out to Kenya Association of Manufacturers, KM in Kenya but it didn't go well. They, we had the standard media group. They had reached out to us. They were completely, they wanted to fund, to fund our project and do a prototype, but uh, that also did not go well. Now we came in, uh, in our university, Kenya to University, we have a center called Chandaria Business Incubation and Innovation Center, where it incubates ideas to People who have ideas to make their own products, and it also have a, have a they have an office called a, of it's a branch of Kipi, that is Kenya Industrial Property Institute. So, the director of the center reached out to us, and um, we pitch our ideas. We say we have these designs, we have this idea, we have made the designs um, before. Actually, at first we thought it would be an open source. We wanted it to, an, to be an open source uh, made device. So we had already planned on how we'll share it on social media, put it out there for everyone to see and everyone to, if they want to make a design of a ventilator. But seeing that the director, the center told that this it could be a very good business model. 
So we handed over our designs to him. He applied for a patent for us, courtesy uh, of Kenyatta University. He applied, he filed for a patent and we are called to the university, each one of us. We are at different places. We are, I was in Eldoret, others are in Nairobi, others are in Kisumu. So we are called to the university to now make a prototype of our designs. So when we came, we came there, we told them, ah, we have all the designs, we just need three days, only three days to make a prototype. Uh, we tried, the, the, now we had an idea of how we'll make a prototype. We said we will 3D print some of the parts, we'll buy another part and we'll try fixing them together and make it work. The first two days, now the 3D printing materials failed us. It failed completely. We could not make it work. Now the three days are over. We had promised by three days we will do it. Now you have to think of other solutions. We had to go to industrial area and look for for people to fabricate for us the the our, our design. So in that process, I should mention that we never slept. We were really on our on, in the office working day and night and try to make it work. So after seven days, finally it worked. Uh, called the media, not by then, we had already applied for a patent. We had already got uh, the file, the document for our patent. So we made sure by the time we go to the media, our, our intellectual pro pro property was, uh, was already protected. Our designs were pro was protected before we put it out there for people to see. So we called the media and uh, we showcased our prototype. That's why I would like to jump in. Uh, that you've brought up uh, out, out very key elements, uh, Professor, that I think we need to trash them out. First of all, interfaculty um, uh, working group. I think it's the future for us to be able to innovate. And as you can see uh, in this team, um, I don't know why you didn't have a mech because you had to go to do fabrication. That's where the, is the issue of technical expertise within our colleges come in. Um, and the future of education for us to be able to innovate, we must be in an ecosystem that allows different players to, to you know, to plug in. You didn't have to go to call Kenya Association of Manufacturers nor go to, to, to fabricate outside that system. But then I'm seeing an element of business. So in your team, there was no business student. And as a nun, yeah. I, I, I get with engineers a lot. I host the Royal Academy of Engineering Forums, Kenya chapter for the of Moe University. I've done it for the last uh, two concurrent years. And one uh, point I tell engineers is that you have to incorporate school of, you, of, of, of business in, in your teams. You even need anthropologists because they're able to now begin to apply the application of, of the internet, the application of the, of the, of the innovation to, to the human aspect of it. And therefore, uh, my question to you, did you go through a canvassing process? Were you taken through the, the entire innovation process? Because that could have been the challenge that made you lose three days trying to, you know, find it the hard way. I think for us, we were lucky enough to have the business center, the business incubation and innovation center. Uh, the director there is a master in economics. So he was the one really handling the business aspect for us because as we were completely into the ventilator, we had no time to, to even think of the costing, the, and we were just trying to make the ventilator work. So our advantage was that we had people who are experts in, in businesses and finances, and they would um, fund us. We buy the things we want and uh, we, everything we needed, we asked, but they handled the business aspects for us. That's the advantage that we had, rather than when we, when we were alone now there with no one to help us, we couldn't have done it. So, so, so the business aspect of the ventilator, is it a company, is it registered as a company? Do you have a business model? Have you interacted with the go-to-market strategy? Um, now what happened, in our scenario with the ventilator, it is just a product. We are not is we are not just a company. It was just a product that a group of students had had developed. Now it comes to businesses. We 
we did a commercialization of our patent where we had to share now our, our percentage share with the university because they funded our project. I think our go-to-market strategy was partnering up with the university because we had a choice to also form our own company and do things with other investors. So we were not really tight, but we decided to go with the university so that they could handle, we transferred our rights to them to handle everything about the production and the business aspect. Once we are done with the designs and the prototyping and making the minimum viable product, now it's just for them to do the production as we wait for the profits and con continue as our lives as a student. As okay. students. So, so Stella, this seems to be linked to your life as a student. Have you thought about the sustainability uh, aspect of it? What happens post campus? Are you going to continue as a team? Have, have you thought about this? Yeah, I've thought about it, but um, maybe we yes, start. Sir. Maybe we start somewhere else in the June by first asking ourselves. You talked about a group in WhatsApp. Um, I guess that was not two people. So how many were you, right? So that we go to uh, the uh, the reality about ownership. Um, after this and thank you very much everybody who is joining us and those who've been with us um, in the past one hour can you believe it we've been here for one hour um, quite an engaging conversation today I am in the middle of a conversation with two incredible ladies June Jepkeme uh, of June Jepkeme live she's also working with Kansas City and I have um, inventor innovator uh, biomedical engineering student Stella Jelagat, uh, who is doing her fourth year at, at Kenyatta University. She is one of the co inventors behind the Tiba vent um, ventilator. And she has a second aspect, uh, a second item, which we are going to um, you know, talk about shortly after this. So let's go back to. To, to this whole idea, because you have a team, and I think June, um, you know, just to pick some of the key highlights, isn't it? They had, they had a team. They set up a what WhatsApp group, yes. and and then they were exchanging ideas in that WhatsApp group. And to me, the key message that comes out there is communication. They were able to communicate because in innovation, if you want to manage innovation in in what we call innovation management, there has to be uh, communication. And actually, the poorest the poorest medium to use for, for for innovation is WhatsApp. People use Telegram, so I think this is something that we, we I, I could give you a tip. Because, and and the the advantage is that in Telegram you can you can manage the messaging very well. You know the uh, uh, the, the um, security there is also very tight, and you can edit your messages if you make an error or something like that. But yes, you established a WhatsApp group. And then you were in a communication, in a closed group. You are talking to each other and discussing what to do and what not to do, or what failed, what did not fail, how to approach, how to not to do it, you know, this kind of thing. And I think the key message there is communication, which is really, really important um, and key to that. So let's go back to question number one. How many were you? Quick fire. Well, the first group where we first said you want to make a ventilator, we were around 60 people in the group. Now, we formed another group where now the ones who actually want to make a ventilator will, will go to. Now, we are about 24 of us interested in making a ventilator. Now, out of the 24, there are those now, the key people who were actually doing the designing and the thinking and the coding and the everything. We are 11 of us at the time. But then we came to university, they saw it that. There's no point as engineers, we make a device that that the end users may not even want, may not even suit their need. So we added a medical student, a nursing student, and a pharmacy student to our group. So to help because they are the end users in the hospital. So to help us in the human human machine interface interaction. Yeah, thank you very much. And I mean, you see that as a typical funnel, isn't it? You start with with a crowd. Um, and, and then you, you go fizzling out until you remain. And then think about 15 out of the original 60, that's one quarter, right? Which is still even higher. I mean, if you think about innovation in industry where I work, um, 
90% of the innovations do not make it to product. 90%. You start with 100 ideas and only 10% of those ideas potentially end up in products and only one out of the 10 actually end up going to the shelves. So going into a product is not the same as going to the shelves because something can go to the product and then it doesn't, it doesn't pass the, the marketing, right? The business case that June was talking about, it doesn't pass the marketing strategy, it doesn't pass the timing, doesn't pass the uh, whatever it is that people talk about. Okay, so 15 of you, you came out with this idea and, and then what is your definitive role in, in that team of 15? Well, uh, my role, according to the patent shares, is a biomedical engineering design mm -hmm. as per the document, the official document. Okay, very good. Now, June, back to your question. You can go on. Yeah, and, and before I even go there, because I just want to post it to you. Um, if you look at Della's team, they were in a very, uh, in, in, a, in a safe space because this innovation was as happening at a time when the country really needed the ventilators, the innovation, and the facilitation was seamless. So from the school, the Chandaria Center of Innovation and the likes. But this is not a typical situation in our universities. The program that I run, the COSA Innovation Ecosystem Initiative, I work with engineering students from uh, at least six universities, Dedan, Kimathi, Moi, TUK, Multimedia University, Meru University, uh, University of Nairobi. And one of the greatest challenges that they face is uh, patenting. The, so they asked me, because um, again, I dare say this, um, a, professor, uh, a professor here has more patents than the entire University of Nairobi since inception, which is a pity because as a country, we cannot even begin to imagine that we can industrialize and improve and create jobs if you are not innovating. And, and so most of the innovations actually are not even patented because they, 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 the, the students are struggling between should we, should I invest resources in patenting or should I just go to the market first? And even that entire process, I don't know where uh, from, from Germany, what are some of these best experiences that you can pick? Where do we start? Do you patent first, do you go to market? What do you focus on? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the whole idea about, about patenting goes through several steps. The first one, which I, I usually go through that as, as, you know, somebody who is active in research and development in industry, is the moment you have an idea, you file something called an invention disclosure. So you do, so it's called an IDD, Invention Disclosure Document. You say, I have found a way of making Ugali or let me, let me just use it. Let me use a very super stupid thing. Say, I have found a way of mixing tea leaves and, 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 um, and, and, um, and sundate to make soap, for example. And what was surprising? So you always need to answer the question. What was the surprise in that? Because if, if mixing those two things doesn't lead to a surprise, that is not an invention. Right? And, and there is a difference between an invention and an innovation. An invention is something that starts from scratch. An innovation is an improvement on an idea, right? So if I went today and took Stella's um, tip event and then I did something to change it, for example, put a remote control to allow the person who is using it to, to, um, you know, to operate remotely, that would be an innovation on top of this. But if, if I, uh, and, and I, I guess when Stella and her team did the tip event, they, they closed an invention space, which is coming back to what you are saying. So you start with invention disclosure. And the beautiful thing about a country like Germany is there is a law that says out there in the country, if Serone comes up with an idea while working for a company called Mars, that idea is supported by the company, but it belongs to Serone, right? So I don't become a slave of my employer. I become the owner of that idea. And when it comes to the time for it to be patented, the company then goes through a due process that goes to check what is the viability of your idea 
and what is the industrial potential of that idea. And once that has been determined, the company comes back to me and says, okay, you know what, we would like to buy your idea from you. I work for them, they pay my salary, I innovate while using their laboratory, but they come back to me and say, can we buy your idea? Because that's what German law says. German law wanted to make sure that we are protected from exploitation by the employer, right? And then I would say, okay, so how much do you give me? So give me so much. There is, a, there is also under the law, there is some, some value. And if we are two, uh, for example, some of the uh, innovations I have, I have with my former interns, my students who came to do internship with me. And, and uh, th then the company goes into a conversation of, okay, you originated with the idea, you are the brains behind it, so you own 90%, the student owns 10%, or you own 50-50 or something like that. Or some of them I own, you know, partly with my technicians and somebody like that. And then it goes to, the, 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 the patent is, is applied, so you get a patent application. If you go to, my, to some of the patent depositories, you get, you get my name, and then you, if you understand the patenting, you have an embargo of 18 months between the time it is filed and the time it is published. In that period of time, the patent application, it is still called a patent application, the patent application is going through a patent search so it goes to the European Patent Office, for example, in Munich, where they do a, a search to check, okay, you claim that you invented something which is novel, right, that is new. What about prior knowledge or prior urge? Is there anything which is similar that is already out there? And I think I was mentioning to you girls uh, the other day that in one of the cases, I, I was the enemy of my own invention because when I filed and they went to check the, um, the, the prior art, so what is known already, they actually realized that prior art was my own publications. My own journal publications were mentioning at the end of each of them that the, the, current, um, you know, the, the current discovery has potential to be used in one, two, three. And when I went to file for a patent, it was too late because it was already out in the public. It was your prior knowledge, professor. Yeah, it was, it was prior knowledge, not only to me, but also people who had read it. Yeah. And, and so if, if that goes through that process and, and you get back the report, you usually get a search report, which is super good because it gives you what is known and the basis that the patent office is likely to use in rejecting. And then you can revise your claims. You can say, I have 30 claims. I'm going to scale them down to 25. So I, and if you read patents, you will see patent applications will have, you know, claim five withdrawn, claim number six withdrawn, because that's what happened when they did the search that they discovered this is already conflicting with the prior art. And, and then they do not want to claim something like that. And when this idea goes to industrialization in Germany, if you remember the first time was you file an invention disclosure and then it, a patent application is made. At the time that a patent application is made, the company buys the rights from you. But then there is another clause that says, if this goes into exploitation, then the company comes back again to you and says, we have exploited your patent idea. We are going to sell so much in terms of volume. So now the calculation of what you benefit at the second level is what are the volumes of sales wow. of products that contain your invention? Fantastic. Right? Yeah, and then, and then you can discuss and say, well, I get 1% of the, uh, the, the sales or I get 2% of the sales or something like that. Yeah, okay. so that it, it is not about just patenting, it is about pushing that idea to really get into okay. implementation and go into products. Because when those products are sold, you also reap the benefits of that patent is being exploited. And, and that is not the ideal situation here, Professor. And that's what I'm, I'm going to tie my next question uh, to what Stella is going through. You can imagine mm -hmm. taking a student through all that process. They, 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 are, they have no means. They probably have no time because they are battling other things. And therefore, most of the innovations. So last year in November, when I was giving a talk at the... Uh, you know, in professors from School of Engineering, Mo University, 
I ask them to try and invent because everybody is innovating. What's your view on that? Of course, um, it's good to innovate, but don't you think we even need our unique inventions that you know touches on our unique challenges and our unique needs as a people? Yeah, I mean it's 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 a topic that we can take the whole day to be honest with you, uh, June, because. To me, sitting out there, I mean, I've been in China for five years before and now in Germany for seven, eight years. And when I look at the innovation space in the developed world, I can tell you it is saturated. There is nothing to innovate anymore here because um, the, the, the ideas are all exploited. The novelty of some of the things we see are basically is basically not there anymore. And, and, and if you think about Africa, even today in the context of COVID-19, um, all the, 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 all the, black, um, the, the black box around traditional medicine, TCM, uh, Chinese medicine, for example, and the traditional medicine that we have in Africa, the herbs, the, the, the phytochemicals that we have in our very rich diversity of flora and fauna, um, would form an incredible basis for, for innovation. And, and I mean, we were talking about the other day about the uh, potential for even innovating a, an ugali maker, something that can be used in, in simplifying the process for making ugali. Uh, I mean, to a, to a white man or a European or an American, ugali is nonsense. They don't, they don't think about it because that's not a big deal for them, right? Um, but for us there, it is, it, is, it is a big deal. And I, and I think I discovered one big problem. I mean, I went through Egerton University where Bill has mother, uh, where uh, Stella's mother also studied. One of the biggest problems we have in Kenya is the way we teach students at university. We, 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 we form a picture of a professor as an all knowing guy who has covered anything that needed to be covered and that the student has nothing more left to discover. This, at least that is the mentality I had at Egerton as a student. I knew that Amos Nzinga, for example, the engineer, rest in peace, um, knew everything about engineering and how to, to dehull uh, soybean. And I can tell you today, after 17 years of study, with nothing else in focus, just milk, I can tell you today, I am as illiterate today as I was at Egerton. And it is because the mentality that was instilled in me here in, in Germany was one of inquisitiveness and adventure. That, that your mind is always provoked to look at another thing from another angle and perspective. And I mean, I always make fun of myself. When I was in China and then the... Uh, the, the university professor from Munich came to China to in, interview me. He said, oh, Serone, I'd like to give you an opportunity to come to my uh, department and, and do further research. I was already doing a PhD in China in, in milk, in, in milk proteins. And when he told me that, I was like, what is there to be known? I mean, I have known everything from bachelor's to master's to PhD. I have been doing nothing else except milk. And he said, no, think again. There might be something you could do. And, and when I got to Munich, what did I discover? I discovered, oh my God, it's not about milk. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to present it one of these days in this show that actually from milk, we get from milk proteins, structural peptides that look like bangi. Bangi, in your sorry. <laughs> Let's just leave it there. I mean, if, if I had come with that very closed mind, I wouldn't have discovered that because when I came to Munich, I was leading my own research group working on bioactive peptides. And, 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 and then that is where this mind started exploding as well. Like, wow, this is why milk sometimes even modulates our behavior. I mean, you think about the milk drinker and think about their behavior, their attitude, their temperament. This, this has something related to that. What did you just say, Professor? Was that the reason you asked me to grab the milk? As you can see, I, I have completely <laughs> changed my mood. And, and that was great. Yeah. I'd like to take it back to Stella before she forgets. Yes. Um, you know, as you can see, our, our, our system here in Kenya is completely different. What have you just had? Are, are those the ends I'm judging about, Professor? Um, um, again, that's on a lighter note. Stella, knowing that we, we don't live in, in a very 
or rather we don't operate in a very structured uh, way as universities where students leave their innovations behind. Have you started thinking as a team uh, on a sustainability plan? What will happen post university? Um, now we, as I previously mentioned about the IEEE team, we usually have uh, conferences like two weeks ago, we had an engineering conference where it was all about us sharing our knowledge to other students because in engineering is very diverse. We, it's always trending and there's always emerging technologies about it. What our lecturers and the professors in universities know, they, it's, I can not, not say bad about it, but it's a bit outdated because now we have new things like robotics, we have new things like AI, all that. Now we do our best as people who already done this great thing to share knowledge to other students or even those who are in their first years or second years to get not only interested in things taught in class, but things that are actually trending in the world right now in the, in the engineering world, things that you can do so that when you get out there, you can, it's a skill that you acquire that you can, know, you can sustain yourself by things like coding, making websites, doing coding a machine or things, things that can help you really out there to earn a living. You don't really have to stick to what you are taught in class and wait for a degree and go look for jobs. Yeah, we do our best to hold workshops and conferences and pass the knowledge on to other students who are maybe behind us or our fellow students. Yeah. We have actually a 3D printer within your hub, the, the Chadaria Center. Yes, we do. We have about five or six. So a 3D printer. We, as I mentioned, the first prototype we made by 3D printing, but we realized that those materials are not suitable for what we want. I have to go for metals. Now that's where we went to industrial area. But maybe there is there is something else, June, that, that I, I really want to capture, isn't it? If you think about looking back now, uh, Stella, if you look back at the time that, that it has taken you from innovation until this time, um, in the company of your colleagues, the, the, the 15 of you, what would you say you would have done differently? Sorry? Can you... what, what, in your opinion, would you have done differently as a team um, to either make it quicker or faster or, or, or make it, um, I don't know, is, is there something, and it doesn't need to be a yes or no that there is, is there something that you look back today and think we should have done something differently or, or you think it was, it was okay, the way you look at it, you, you look at the result and where you are, and where you started and, and you think it's okay, we, we went, uh, you know, the right way and using the right pace and the learnings were, were picked. Yeah, uh, I should say that at first we were very naive of what a ventilator is really, because the first, the first prototype we made, we could not even have taken it to a hospital. The nurses will look at it and like say, I prefer that one from abroad. So yeah, there were mistakes that were made. There are things that if we had known earlier, we would have made the prototype a bit faster, but we are very new at this. Nobody in our team had tried something like that. So it is a continuing improvement. Even now we, are, we have ideas of improving the current, the current one, but we can't because it's already satisfied. So yeah, I, I wish we would have known other things like fabricating. We all don't stuff like getting partners outside. There are small companies that are trying to to this to do the innovations, the things like PCB making PCBs. That's printed circuit boards. If we had maybe if the university had like machines to print PCBs, which would have been a bit faster. If we had uh, people who are interested in making PCBs, they would have done the PCBs in the university or make something, make a product. So 
it and really yeah, yeah it has really prompted like the university to maybe provide a space for people who want to innovate and uh, improve the bring in the facilities that are possible make it possible for somebody to actually make a, an actual product mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I think the reason I'm asking this is because, I mean, if you went out there to, to economies that are fairly well advanced in, in innovations management, the, the key words, right, innovations management, you, you have something called, um, you have something called a gate process that, that you maintain, you maintain a, a decision making matrix, which is guided by milestones, you say, okay, and it's not okay that you you say you can design it and and you think it will just go to the to 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 the market. That's why you have things like alpha prototype. You have a beta prototype, and then you have um, you know something that it's. That's why the prototype word is still attached to it. But I think one of the things that I see June and and I don't know whether you see this as well when you talk to your engineering students and the and and the the guild of engineers is the whole gamut of, of innovations management, where you say there is a very clear procedure from you are collecting a forest of ideas, you take them through a filtering step where very clear deliverables are defined, very clear, if you like, eh, the route to success. How do you move from where you are to success? Because for me to be able to make a, a, let's say a claim or even innovate, I go through around about seven stage gates, you know? And, and these are ideas which were borrowed from NASA. How NASA manages, for example, a, a rocket launch. It goes through something called a TRL process, TRL, technical readiness level uh, process with stage gates that are managing um, you know, that are, that are managing these kind of steps that you say, okay, step number one is we are going to have a mock-up. It doesn't need to be something that is really uh, big enough to, to accommodate somebody, but you want to have a prototype that is 3D printed, having exactly the shape and, 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 and you know, the attributes that you want. And then once you do that, step number two will be possibly to improve on aesthetics. You say, okay, we have something that is working, but it's still looking very ugly. It doesn't look like it is something that is attractive because you, you are answering several questions. You're answering the question of functionality. You are answering the question of aesthetics. And then you think about, okay, um, how about something called do it best, which is you're using, you're using some um, fiber carbon, uh, carbon fiber, instead of using a metal uh, yeah. material. So you want to save on material in order to deliver something which is, which is making a, a business case. So you think about something we call total cost of ownership, TCO. Um, I'm going to bombard you with all this uh, information today. You know, sometimes when I speak to people in Nandi, they look at me and think I am just uh, some very awkward guy lost in the village somewhere. <laughs> Let me bring out a bit of the scientist. So, and then you think about the, the total cost of ownership. How do you cut down on the pricing? How do you position your, your product? Are you going to position it as an economy product or are you going to, pro, uh, are you going to position it as a, as a premium product? Because you, you're thinking now about the market niche. Where do you want to put it? Do you want to put it in the, uh, in the purse you take, uh, you know, category or you want to put it in, in Kwanga soap uh, category, right? They both do the same thing, but for two different markets, um, uh, niches. One is for a, a premium market, the other one is for um, an economy market. And, and, and so you have, you have this kind of very clear um, gated process that you say, okay, an idea will have to go through up to TRL5, we call it TRL5, where it is technically ready, you have a prototype, it can actually be used by somebody, but then it is still expensive. And you say, okay, now we have it at TRL5, we are going to have a conversation about industrialization. How do we take this idea, having been fabricated with a 3D printer to being produced at industrial level, where you are going to target, let's say, productions of a thousand of them a day, instead of, 
in, instead of one per, per thousand minutes, you're going to go for thousand of them per day. You know, you know those sort of things. Because this is, this is going to translate to efficiency. It is going to translate to, um, we lost Stella, but we can, we can go on as, as we wait for her. It's, it's going June to translate to efficiency. It's going to translate to the cost. Because if you have a guy who is running a printer for 1,000 hours to produce one unit, the cost of that will not be the same as having a guy who is going to produce a thousand units in a day. Because These are different uh, business models all, th all together. Yeah. And, and so I'm thinking about how about the innovation management process? How is it, how is it like really? Do you, have, do you have meetings where you say, we've delivered milestone one, now let's move to the, the next step. We've delivered milestone three, let's move to the next step. We've delivered all the milestones and we've met all the critical success factors, what we call CSFs, right? CSF, critical success factor. If we don't meet the critical success factor, if I mix, if I have told this meeting that I'm going to mix a solution with this milk and the color I will get is blue. If I don't get a color blue, that's failure. If I get a color green, that's unexpected. Right? And so I cannot move to the next level where I'm going to make cheese if this color is not blue. If I said I make blue and then I make cheese, then if this doesn't turn to blue, there is no way I can, I'm going to make cheese. I have to still work on making this blue. I think that's basically what I'm trying to say. How is the innovation management process? Process life, yeah. So I'll take you back to exactly what I tell uh, the professors in engineering. And that's why, Professor, we are doing a a completely, um, I think there's a completely new curriculum for postgraduate because we believe that innovation and innovation happens mostly at postgraduate level. Now, I'll, I'll use an example. If you go to Skolkovo University, we must be aware of Skolkovo University in, 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 in Moscow, Russia. They have a facility called Skoltech. Now, when you go to Skoltech, Skoltech is the innovation management hub of Skolkovo University, state-owned, funded 100% by the Russian government. Now, as you walk into Skoltech, you will not even realize that you're in a university. Why? Because they are directly linked to the industry. And um, I remember when I visited there last time, 90% um, of their robots had already been booked for commercialization. What does that tell you? It means that there is... Um, there is, uh, can I call it quadruple helix, kind of a relationship between the academia, the industry, um, the consumer, or should we say the non-state actors and the government, and all of them are speaking towards getting that premium product that has taken care of the economies of scale, has looked at um, the commercial specialization has look at funding and has look at the, um, the, 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 the future of that particular product. We don't have the same here in Kenya. When you go to Pretoria, the innovation hub that supports some of those universities in Pretoria, I was, I was surprised to find that uh, within the, inno the innovation hub, they had orders for a particular substance that was going to support the production of um, whatever chemical that was to support bone marrow the people with bone marrow disease, within an innovation hub, commercial, the same space they were utilizing uh, byproducts of um, 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 Amarula to make cosmetic products and they're already getting orders and they're commercializing. What we, what we lack in our innovation space in the country at the moment is lack of that ecosystem that allows everybody to really focus on what they are in because I believe that academia is supposed to be industry responsive. Where are we getting problems that we need to, to solve? We, are get, we should be getting from the industry. What is the market looking? What are the gaps? What are the challenges? Who is funding? I mean, it's, it's unfortunate in Kenya we find our professors uh, with plugins, you know, you know, rioting, asking for, for more salaries. Yet in other countries, like some professors I work with from uh, Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology are declining grants because they are overwhelmed. They have enough money for research. Our entire process, Professor, is not industry responsive. And so I tell them not to focus a lot more on papers and peer reviews, but to go back to basics and get us actual solutions that can be commercialized. Because 
if you look at Samsung as a product, Samsung is a product that was in, um, that was an innovation at Kai East Korea. And some of the most highly sought after people within that specific research R&D center are anthropologists. Why? Because they are the ones guiding on the user interface yeah, of, of, for this particular product. So LG, LG is a product from a university in Korea and we can go on and on. So the, the, the challenge really is how do we build that quadruple helix engagement so that we allow innovators like Stella to focus on the process of innovation. Then June can pick it up and take it to the industry. And another person will now be able to tackle the aspects of funding, um, policies, even the policy framework is not uh, supported. Look at our IP laws in the country. And I'm very, I would like to suggest that we have an IP conversation next time. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at some of the innovations in this country, the founders are all white. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we don't protect our ideas in a way that facilitates commercialization. We only protect for the sake of protecting it. And half of the time, we don't protect. And um, I think that would be my submission with that regard. So the entire structure has to change. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it is. It is, it is it's a journey that we've begun, but it's yeah. not an easy one. Yeah, yeah. thanks, June. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a very powerful submission, and I think what I pick from you, it's come over through and through and through, is the the two key words, a phrase. Now, it is about the ecosystem. It's about the ecosystem because when you have an ecosystem, you have innovation. You have you have industry. So in Germany, for example, in the food industry. Um, my research at the university was funded um, at one time to the tune of 1 million euros um, for equipment and PhD students and all this by industry partners. Did you say 1 million chairs Yeah, just, just 1 million euros, just, just 1 million euros for... for, for <laughs> <laughs> and and this, this was coming from from food industry partners, because there is a very clear message in, in Germany that the, 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 the industry gets a, a tax rebate by investing in research. So they, they contribute a certain amount of their, of their revenue to fund a kitty, which is it's called AIF, the, uh, the German industry uh, organization. And I mean, at one time I was discussing with one of the MPs and I was saying, why don't you start move a motion in parliament to set up a, a kitty where all industries that are related to agriculture contribute a certain percent of money into that kitty that is then contested for or people apply from those institutions that do research and take this money. So it's about the ecosystem where you have industry, you have academia, you have you have government and the role of government is nothing else the role of government is just to set the framework you know and i, I always get sad when i see people saying uh, where is the county government to help us doing this it means there is a failure we don't understand what the role of government is the role of government is not to do business the role of government is to set up the framework to enable business to thrive um, and Stella is not the last case. I mean, we had the other boy from Mosuriot somewhere there who invented a candle that was repelling malaria, um, uh, causing, um, you know, mosquitoes. He, he, he managed to squeeze some herbs, made a candle out of it, and, and he was inhaling all these fumes. At one time, I had to send him money to say, you know, buy some protection and protect yourself. But let's go to Stella because of time. I mean, we, we can go on and on. Um, Stella, I guess that the two key questions that need to come out today is that girls can also do science and they actually innovate and you don't need to wait until you reach PhD or professor uh, for you to innovate. That, that is something you've shown, you and your team, and it's not only you, it's all of you. And, and the other thing is that it was being done under very difficult circumstances, that this is not a very in innovation friendly environment. And that notwithstanding, you managed to, to, to you know, come together, communicate in your WhatsApp group, translated that into this prototype, and now it is about to be exploited um, at industrial level. I guess the question that people want to find out out there is, are you going to 
stop at your bachelor's level or are you intending to go on with your education? Do you think there is still something you can learn or you want to go straight into Stella Limited and start making your own uh, fabricators and then introduce to us the, the other item that you mentioned that you, you invented? I don't know, June, if I took it correctly or you want to add anything? Oh, is it me? Yeah. Question. Yeah. yeah, it is. Well, right now I'm stuck in between two things. Going for my master's, trying to mm -hmm. specialize in a narrow, because right now my course is so wide. It is a wide, it's so wide, such that you, I'm forced to choose what should I really specialize in. Maybe mm -hmm. look at cellular engineering, look at biomedical instrumentation, a small thing that I need to specialize in and become a master in it, or I can, now that I know how to come up with an idea, come up with a product, a prototype, then go come up with a product. I know the right people to go to when I want to make something. I know the right people I can partner with so that I can make a product successful. So, and I'm still debating on those two, whether to go for masters abroad or somewhere and advance my studies or maybe focus on making things, making products, maybe medical products, starting a company, now that I know the whole process of how it goes, applying for IP, looking for market, looking for investors to invest in your, in your design, but for the future. That's a talk for the future. I still have one more year to complete my studies here in Kenya University. Yeah, June is obviously smiling very broadly. I don't know why, but she. By looks... the way, Stella, if I were you, I would use this opportunity to get a third grant. You know, this professor gets a lot of grants in his name. By the time you see a professor having ten patents, my friend, he's rejecting some grant money, and he's in your speciality. How do you miss that opportunity? <laughs> I will not allow you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. like we always Absolutely say, and I, and I, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I'm, I'm not laughing. I'm, I'm just, I'm just having fun because these are two incredible women, um, with, with a very strong sense of personal drive. I, I think the message that I wanted to really come out of this conversation is, nobody is sitting behind you and holding a. a and holding a fire on your feet and saying run or I burn you. You guys have your own personal drive. Um, you're pushing yourselves and, and you know pushing the limits, you're breaking the glass ceiling and, and challenging the stereotype, which is girls are not mathematicians, they are not engineers, they are not business. Uh, I remember June when she used to come at the end of the news broadcast on KSFM and says, this is June Tipkeme with the business news. And then and it was like, you know, that became June. It, it was her, if you didn't hear June, um, you know, broadcasting business, it was like, there's no business to talk about. Yeah, right. So, and I think this is what June and I were discussing the other day. We need Stella, the brand. How do we bring it out, June? Because this is, you know, education is one thing I can, I can, I can discuss with, with, with Stella, I can discuss with her mother, and, and then we can think about how to you know, push her a little. I still believe that a bachelor's degree is not enough for innovation. You need, you need to move to at least a master's level. Um, in Germany, it doesn't need to be in a theory university. It can be in a practical university, what we call a Fachhochschule, which is where you will actually do a master's with a focus in technology. You know, the, the guys who go to Diguna in uh, June, uh, those guys who are working in Diguna, they didn't go to a theory university. They went to a university of applied science, which is, the, which is focused on how do you translate your knowledge into a business um, and, and, then, and then really make it uh, profitable. But then I think the, the what, what was I asking? It's about Stella the brand. June and and then you know this is your area. So how do we ensure that Stella the brand comes out and Stella you have your innovation that you need to bring it out uh, at at the moment. So I'm I'm going to open it as June asks you about Stella the brand. Stella. 
Did, did we lose Stella? Oh, please. We, did, did we lose? No, we didn't lose Stella. Stella, so uh, th there was the second question about your current innovation. You have something you've invented that is owned by you. You are not, is it owned by the 15 of you or it's only owned by you? No, it's, uh, I made it. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's not affiliated with other people. Can, can you can you explain to us briefly? I'm going to share my uh, my desktop or you want to do it yourself? Feel free. Oh yeah, it's a hand washing station. I mm -hmm. made it. Um, it's around like two of us, we helped each other make it. Mm -hmm. um, it's purpose was to like, now seeing in Kenya, you know, whenever I walk around, maybe town or like everywhere else, you see tanks, the washing station you set up you like you have to open it and wash your hands that does not really help much in preventing spread of infections so we come up with a photo operated hand washing station which mm -hmm. is unique on its own because it's made of stainless steel it does not rust and it looks a, a presentable yeah anyone can like anyone can use it because mm -hmm. when you say it's photo operated maybe people start thinking oh that's old technology or something but I made sure it looks really presentable so you it's easy to use yeah I'm, I'm going to play the video then I mute it so you can explain okay. to you can explain to people um, what it is that they are seeing on on this because this is this is your idea um, and and so I will share my screen um, and I hope, I hope it starts. You you can see it is uh, it's loading. So, what would be the what would be the market for this? Um, June, I guess this is where we always want to keep talking about. When you innovate something, it is great to have an idea. It's great to have a patent. But if this doesn't go into into a market, then it doesn't really. Um, it, it doesn't make sense, right? So it, it has to end up somewhere. Where is it ending up to? What, what would be the market target for this? Is it schools? Is it hotels? Is it families? Um, yeah, I start the video now, but it's taking time. So in this video, I was demonstrating how the put operated hand washing machine works. Yeah. You can wait for it to load. I think it's taking a bit of, let's see whether it's loading. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes it's because of the rights protection from my, my computer, but maybe I can just show the, I think there was a picture. So if I open it, uh, the video has a, a sort of a preview. Just give me a minute. Uh, technology can behave sometimes, right? <laughs> okay. Which one can you see? Can you see this? So just just go on now, Stella. Can you see this? Uh, yeah. Can you I see, can your, see the yeah. video? Yeah. So that is. I, I just want to leave it like that so that it's visible. I think if I play it, it just buffers. So what are we seeing here? Basically, you can you can point with with the mouse. Do you want me to give you? Uh, it's fine. I can I can direct you. Yeah. Now, the, yeah. This was the hand washing station I was talking about. Mm -hmm. the, the key thing with this hand washing station is that it accommodates children and persons with disability mm -hmm. and uh, it also it does not trust and it's photo operated mm -hmm. so it's completely contactless you, you don't have to touch anything there you just have to operate it with your foot and then the other thing about it you can have as you can have it as big as you want for now that the one that you're seeing 
So this is the this is the container for yeah, for, yeah. for holding the liquid, right? Yeah. The and, the mm -hmm. sorry. Go. The container I think is of uh, sixty liters, but you can. The good thing with this, I can scale it up to a larger volume. I mm -hmm. can scale it up to 100, 200, 500 liters, and they also have more hand washing stations on the sides. You can have three on each side of the of the of the tank, depending so on the volume of water. So this is the this is the hand washing. This is where yeah. the water is coming from. So yeah, that's somebody, where steps, the water, somebody steps. Somebody down. steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the water will come out, and also the water that comes water, out. yeah. And the soap is on the on the left side. Yeah, it's and pinkish. It, yeah, yeah. And that soap, you can have. You can also adjust the size of the holder of the bottle in case mm -hmm. you have a bigger bottle of soap that you want to use. And also mm -hmm. that water tray, you can adjust the height of the water tray. So if you have children, you can easily lower the water tray down so that they can reach. Mm -hmm. Or you have persons with disability, maybe somebody is in a wheelchair, you can yeah. lower the water tree down. Okay, so this can be adjusted, um, it can be adjusted yeah. in height, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. yes. And then the, the dirty water is collected here and there is this yeah. There's a drainage. here is taking it to the waste uh, bucket. Yeah. yeah, the waste bucket. Right, 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 right. So my market okay. plan was maybe hotels or mm -hmm. business premises. Yeah. So even in hospitals. Yeah. Because hospitals are highly infectious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, and you call it clean it. This Just is clean the it. Uh, yeah. This is the, uh, the the name of 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 the uh, piece of equipment. So, uh, dear listener and dear watcher, what we, what we are seeing here is the second uh, innovation from Stella. She, she was part of 15 who innovated on the TIBA vent, the uh, COVID-19 ventilator that is partly owned by Kenyatta University and 15 of them. And then here there is, uh, Joseph, that is the biggest I could zoom, but I will add a link and, and I will also update the, um, I will update the video as well on, 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 um, on, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the what? not WhatsApp, on the Facebook uh, profile. Somebody is asking me, Joseph Kibruti is asking me to make the picture bigger. I've tried, that's the biggest it could uh, get. And, and so this is the second innovation by Stella, which is basically a, um, a hand washing, food operated hand washing um, uh, station that dispenses soap on the right or on the, on the left side and water would be coming out of this um, this portion here. Um, I don't know whether people are seeing what I'm seeing, by the way, because I'm I'm pointing at things. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is where water would be coming out. Soap is on the left side, and this is a collection trough. And then the waste water is discharged into this pink uh, plastic uh, container down there, and so. For orders, you can you can place your orders directly by contacting Stella. I have given the uh, the the address or the not the address but the telephone number there. Do you want to repeat it, Stella, for those who are keen on following us? To repeat the operation. Right? No, repeat, repeat the phone number for contact and order. Oh, okay. My phone number is zero seven nine five three two eight. Seven two two. Just repeat it for the sake of, of them. Okay, so I repeat it again. Mm -hmm. Zero seven nine five yeah. three two eight seven two two. Very good. Um, June, I think that's around about it from my side. How about you? Because we are talking about brand Stella. How do we brand Stella so that we don't leave it uh, before clarifying that? You're muted, June. You're muted. June, you're muted. And I didn't mute you. You muted yourself. <laughs> I was I was actually unmuting because an, a phone was, was coming. It just allowed me to... Sherry, pick this call, please. Sorry, it's an important call that has to be put. 
Just allow me to just pick this call. Yeah, take it. It's okay, June. I, I mute you. Um, okay, Stella, I, I think the, the message is, and if you think about branding, people want to see, people want to see Stella the brand, right? So you are Stella the scientist, that's what we've seen. You're Stella the A student, that's what we've seen. You're Stella the inventor, that's what we've seen. But, you know, going forward, you would like to have an image of Stella that is marketing for marketing. And, you know, to tell you the truth, those of us who work in R&D, um, innovating and inventing a product is one thing. If any innovation doesn't reach the consumer, if there is no marketing, it just dies. And there is no, there is, there is, there is nothing as bad as a great idea that doesn't reach the market. And I can give you thousands of examples of them um, that never made to the market, including what June was talking about, Samsung. Um, you know, Samsung has a, a great way of encouraging innovation. They do something called Friday afternoon innovations, where once one day a week, everybody has a free day to, to innovate whatever they want. Yeah, to innovate whatever they want. One day a week where you do crazy science, you innovate an idea and, and then Samsung can buy it from you and mainstream it. And I can tell you one of them, one of them that is still not out here today is actually a, a wearable where you, you wear something like a watch, like I'm wearing a watch and it projects on your hand, the dial, the dial part. So you can press on your hand to dial the phone and you can answer directly from your from from your watch so you don't need to do like it uses your hand as a as a dial as a, as a as a face and a dial pad and that is one of the innovations that came out of the friday afternoon kind of crazy innovations um, that that we are currently encouraging in other companies to sort of copy so how do we brand stella going forward and how do we make sure that stella the brand remains innovative creative and I think, June, there was another question you asked about incubation. How do we incubate the, the innovators? And how do we bring in business managers to manage the innovators? I don't know whether we can manage that in three minutes, but I'm okay if we go beyond uh, the time. Please. Go I on. don't know what to do because that is, that is what I do. That, that is what I drink, I sleep. That is, that is my greatest uh, mission, Professor. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at my show, June Chief Keme Special, my job is to try and brand innovators, innovation and enterprises, because the reason they don't thrive is because, uh, first of all, they are focusing on building the product and no one is focusing on taking the, market, the product to the market. Some of the uh, entrepreneurs that I've interviewed in my show have confessed to having what you call the founder's fatigue. You see, as, as, as an innovator, you go to sit back and agree and accept the fact that you cannot take the product to the market because you don't know. So you need to stay back in the back of it, Stella, and continue innovating and having a team that gives you the feedback from the market so that you sit in the lab and ensure that you improve on that product. That's why we don't want you to come in and run the business. We want you to sit back in the lab and continue churning out innovations. But now that, that entity that you form should have uh, either partners or, or you, you funding to be able to hire people who will now focus on the business model, right? Now, like, like for instance, the, pro the product that you just showcased, um, I would, from a business point of view, I'll ask you, what's your value proposition? Uh, what, what differentiates you from the current products in the market? What's your pricing model? Yeah, how is your distribution ch uh, uh, channel like? How do I pay, you know, how much? And so many other issues. You cannot do that as an innovator. Someone got to do that. So that is the point at which we now introduce aspects of angel investors. But if you are lucky enough to have money, you can do your bootstrap. And, and that's another complete conversation we need to have. So looking at that product, begin to think of partners, especially who are able to pump in money and help you do mass production. Number two, brand it properly and, and, and to give it um, to make it attractive, we call it in business sexy, so that you know people can pick your product uh, compared to other products. And then you've got to be very clear on who you are, 
your market is. You must do what we call persona building. Uh, you know, who is it that you are targeting? Do you know them? What? How do they show? You know, what what are their demographics like? You know, so that you even know where to place your product, and then you know, get a team to now go market it out there and sell it. That is an entire business. And you know, you've got to register a company. You, you need to have board members. And as you look for board members, the, the people who will add value to your product. So that's the way to now begin to build product, Brand Stella. Brand Stella can continue to thrive as a company in Kenya, in anywhere in the world, as Stella continues to learn to improve. I, I, I subscribe to the Jew um, philosophical approach to learning where they, they argue that learning, even for the sake of it, is important. So continuous education is a must still for you to be the kind of a great innovator that will have an impact in the society. Um, yeah, so prof, uh, prof, that's what I'm trying to do at a personal level to showcase business. And if you can allow me, I could just run um, just a summary of the businesses that I've been able to show. It's a I do help the modern woman to look good because I know by looking good, it helps a woman be productive in her workplace and at home. There was a beauty industry which is very broad, right? You have hair, you have fragrance, but what was missing was face, which we call color cosmetics. They say God pushes us to try out that new thing that we never thought we could do before. We thought that uh, we could include it as one of our programs to get people to learn how to play, get them to interact, create synergies, and work together. If anyone has a child right now who's anything between four years old to 13 years old, the world they're getting into four years from now, five years from now is going to be different. You have no idea. Online work has a lot, a lot of potential. What you need is only be focused and have patience. Something doesn't grow within a day. How did you transition from a student taking HR to a business owner? Over the years, I've come to do more research into what fashion entails and what I can do about it. Right now, I am doing t-shirts, I'm doing hoodies, I'm doing capes. I'm also doing bomber jackets. Vertical farming is the future. This is an alternative solution that can actually be sustainable to both households, to consumers, and everyone with an interest in eating healthy. Our dream is to convert African businesses from 1.0 to an Africa 3.0 business that takes full advantage of digital technologies to spar and make profits in their business. So, Prof, those are just summaries of businesses that have been showcasing young people, most of them, all of them, except Angela. Angela is the first lady that showed as a, a beauty shop. The second lady, she's called Nelly Tukong. She innovated her own line of cosmetics. She, she's gotten to that level where she has great, I mean, turnover in millions, but now she's gotten founder fatigue. She cannot, she can no longer, you know, run that business. She needs to sell some shares and, and retain uh, manageable uh, space uh, and Vivian and you know all those young people that's that's the marketing part that I do for innovators entrepre entrepreneurs and business people so um, really my encouragement to you is that uh, mainstream your business you have to make it an entity an enterprise and be the shareholder but sit back and do what you're good at and that is developing an idea and providing solutions that can be commercial. Oh, and you can follow my channel on Junche um special on YouTube. Tata, Tejo. I mean, this, this is a very, very, very informative session we've heard. Um, so far and I'm, I'm really i mean stella we said it before we repeat it every time i'm very very proud of you um personally i mean having gotten to know you about i don't know the last one we can thanks a lot to dan okemwa who who connected us uh, because it wasn't easy to get to you um and and i think there is something that you had you haven't mentioned isn't it that Having done all these innovations, you got recognition by the head of state himself. Um, can you share for us that moment 
when you are mentioned by Uhuru Kenyatta um, on, on TV? Yeah, he had a speech on the Madaraka Day, that was June 1st, mm -hmm. where he was uh, giving the Uzalendo Awards to people who did outstanding things in the community. He mentioned the students who made the ventilator. Now that was us, me included. Uh, we are very happy. We out of all the publicity that we already had, this was now the climax of everything, having to be recognized by the president and him. That for us, it showed that the government was actually following up on what we had done. The president also was following up on the things that we were doing. So it showed that it was such a great thing to have done. As as a student, and being me, me as a fourth year student, I'm only 23 years old. You don't get to be to have that kind of recognition mm. any day of your life. So it's such a, a humbling moment. For yeah, me. yeah. So what 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 does Uzalendo um, award entail? Did you get Did you get something? Did you get a certificate? Did you get uh, uh, Did you get invited to state house for dinner? Um, do you get to sit with Uhuru Kenyatta at the presidential pavilion during celebrations? Well, what is it? You know. <laughs> uh, but now we are still not yet. We have still not yet have done all that. You are mm -hmm. promised, but mm -hmm. still waiting for it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I mean that's that's really incredible. At, at 22, I don't know where I was actually. I I probably was still struggling at Capsule with Boys uh, before I left. Um, and and this is this is part of the reason why we wanted to celebrate you. You know, going through all the journey that you've gone through with your mother as well uh, by your side, mentoring. And I see lots of information coming from all of you that are commenting about mentorship, the role of the mother, the role of the parents, um, and and innovation and and what help you can get. I see ideas already coming from Wakili Ruti Joseph that you can actually do an automated part of the food operated um, hand uh, washer and you can incorporate a, an auto dryer as well. Mm -hmm. So when you when you add these accessories, uh, remember uh, Joseph Ruti for some part of the IP, um, you know. Prior knowledge already yeah. Already given us prior yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I, I will encourage the two of you, you, Stella and June, to continue the conversation even offline after this. It doesn't need to end today because I, I think we really need to ensure that your ideas exactly go the way that Judy, uh, I mean, June was mentioning. And, and I have very good examples of people who, who are managing. Um, who are doing exactly that kind of, you know, innovator uh, fatigue kind of thing. If you look at the guys who founded Uber, for example, um, they are not using their money. They are using money from angel investors, people like me who say, okay, I'm done with the tea industry. I want to invest my 10 shillings with an idea like this. And I floated this idea once when I was asking your friend, uh, Jepur, uh, Jepur and Rogers, I said, set up a farm invite us to invest money in it because I do not want to go and do any management, but I want to be told, hey, Serone, can you give me 1,000 US dollars? And I'm going to invest in, in, in my business. You own 1% of that business. I, I would love to do that. And then we say, okay, you get out of that business because you are not a business person. I'm sure some of the language that you heard from June when she talks about value proposition, what pain were you solving? You know, when we talk about value proposition, we are saying, what was the pain that you identified? And, and what were you solving in, in that pain? And what is the cost of that solution versus the alternatives that somebody else can get it from your competitors? This is information that is overwhelming for your mind. It is outside your, your, your discipline, but somebody like June, that is second skin for her. Right? So if, if we could get to a point where we say, we want to nurture talent of innovators like yourself, but then we want to hire um, managers and incubators, 
And we get people who do that so that we who are scientists remain with thinking and innovation. We get people who translate that to business. We get people who manage that business. And then we, each one of us does their role. And, and we, really, we really then can, can, can run the value chain, if you like, um, from, from innovation all the way to the marketplace. And, and this is what I think we need to encourage, not only you as a girl child, but also any other innovator that is out there to say, let's do what we are good at and let those who are good at other things do them for us. There is no shame in saying, uh, and I mean, I, I have a farm, for example, where I don't manage myself. I hired somebody to do it because I don't know what to do with tea. And I have somebody who runs the, uh, the tea farm. All I want to know at the end of the week is, do I need to pay anybody? And then I ask questions. Why is the payment for this week more than the payment for last week? That, those are the questions I ask. But I will not go there and keep asking, how do I develop you know, seed, seedlings, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to take this conversation to an end. And thank you really, really very much, Stella, for your time, for having spent this opportunity with Kokwet at JSON. Um, we broke from Kokwet at JSON today to Kokwet at JSON stroke June Jepkeme live to, to host this. Because I always tell June, and you remember you were asking about ideas, June, you say, what do I do? I say, bring girls in STEM, because that is where you go. Um, you, you really hold their hands and you help them uh, to grow. And so I think from my side um, as, as a host in Germany, and, and as a native of Nandi County, I'm super proud to be identified with a history of, of you know, the, this innovation and the fact that you have a mind to innovate. And I will go out of my way to make sure you two ladies get to Germany to do whatever it is you want to do at the next Thank level. Um, unless, come on, Moje, that's up to you. Um, so for me, I will, I will just sign off and then I let you guys say what it is you want to say as your, or maybe I let you say it first and then I, I, I can sign off because once I sign off, maybe people will start quitting. Um, Stella, do you have, or do you want to go first, June? Any, anything as, okay. a, as Stella a closing can, remarks? Stella can go first because she's a subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, mine is to say thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for also enlightening me about innovations and patenting and also branding and marketing. That's something that I really need. You see, my mind is to just focus on the engineering concept, engineering and make the product a real thing. I don't know nothing about branding and marketing. And that's where I can really fail. I can have a really good product, but not get it out there. So I would like to also continue this conversation about with June and with also your professor about innovations in marketing and branding. And all in all, thank you for having me. A very strong woman, isn't it, John? What do you see? Fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm extremely um, proud of her. She's extremely articulate and very clear on what she wants at a very young age. The best you can do is to hold her hand, support her, expose her, cheer her up, and I mean, big ups to the mother for bringing up such an amazing human being. Um, Stella, stay focused. Um, listen to Professor. He, there are things he told me 10 years ago that I've not been able to do. Please don't be like me. <laughs> do it. <laughs> and... Uh, Definitely, we will catch up offline. Uh, but from where I'm seated, I would like to really thank you so much, Professor, for having me um, on this show. Uh, I'm honored to have been part of this conversation. And to the listeners, um, we, we, we're really uh, happy and uh, honored to have you because without you, this would be just a conversation of three people. Thank you for, for really tuning in and keeping us company for those two hours. Anybody listening, wherever they are, I always um, challenge each and every one of us that come uh, with it. You know, mami gine gegure luck. I'm a man and 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 I'm
Yeah, but the nasibu, mami, but the nasibu. You really have to work hard. Last time I gilly, last time I gilly, mami, I would be pretty honest with all of you. Uh, for the past 48 hours, Kotoma, more than five hours. I mean, it's not healthy, but it's a fact. Yeah, we have to work extremely hard. I mean, um, on Thursday, I was in the middle of a, of a workshop somewhere and at around one, I was told that I need to be in Eldoret the following day for another meeting. And I'm in Nairobi and there were no flights. So I drove alone to Eldoret on, on, a, on, a, on a Thursday night, um, you know, trying to catch up with the rush hour, but I also needed to be back in Nairobi. So I drove back uh, on, all right, I flew back on Friday. And by Saturday, we, so what I'm trying to say is that there's no shortcut in life. Discipline, consistency, and, and just set goals, yeah? Everyone has their unique paths. Eh? Just pick that and work on it, and you'll definitely succeed. Do your little thing. My former CEO, the late Bob Polimo, once told me that Jude, the secret to success is just hard work. And start by you know taking charge of your morning and take charge of your day and just take charge of your life. That's all from my end. I thank you so so much. My name is Jun Chekeme. <laughs> you forgot to say I work low you are a Yeah. <laughs> So a very big, very big, very big thank you for all of you who really wanted to be part of this conversation on Zoom. It wasn't possible because we wanted to keep it disciplined and, and you know, narrow to, to Stella, June, and myself. But we appreciate your interest. Continue to subscribe, June Jepkeme, on, on YouTube and as well on the page. You have the link on this message on YouTube that you can go to her page and, and, sub, and you know, like the page and follow. Uh, click on like and follow my page, follow my uh, YouTube channel as well. And we invite you to, you know, give us suggestions on the guests that you would like to be having. Just heads up, next week we go back to a bit of culture. We will be talking with Pastor Samuel Rabje Magar on the life stage of a boy. So we'll be talking about the, the so <laughs> Ko <laughs> Ngot komite yun chiget maganyo kwa jigo ni omite sitting room ma mamito kwa kwa ya katuga mo mamito ga antu kyo jata kya. We are trying to deal with the stereotypes and really reinvent um, the, the, the African child, if you like. Uh, so my wago ngoi chito ul nge nyo na fasi nyo yu. To bill us, uh, bill us, uh, you know, mama na bachela kati gilgei. Uh, we are all praying for you and praying for your daughter. We know she's going places. Um, and, and like we said, you know, June and, and, and Stella will continue the conversation. Now you have one friend in Nairobi and uh, Stella. You can, you, can, you can go and do a night over there and, and help her to do a few things while she works until midnight. June, Lady J. Mogheni Google Life stops after 10, 10 hours, 45 minutes. That's what the rule at Mars is, 10 hours, 45 minutes. That's why you see you find me on Facebook making all this noise because I do my eight hours, maximum 10, 45. But you know, Kenya is different. Go give a picture, a cigarette to you when you get in your side, and we talk me. And then we could as well have Stella back again uh, for a more focused conversation on, on one of the two. If you want, I'm always open to, to that. 
We have David Coet, who will be coming in three weeks to discuss management of science in Kenya at that level that he was, um, plus innovation and all the challenges that people face in, in this kind of thing. A very big thank you to all of you for the time that you saved and spared today to be with us. And apologies to those, of you, to those of you who came in here expecting to hear me bubble in my mother, mother tongue today because it wasn't possible. And I mean, you can imagine I'm not comfortable speaking in English, but I tried. Um, I tried my best. Thank you all of you for your comments on Facebook. I've seen uh, James Mayo, James Mayo, James Mayo, Koske, Brotichek, Jevoriot, Ambrose, Ambrose, all of you have been watching and interacting. Aspel Gebrot, um, all of you have been interacting and you know leaving your comments there. And we really, really appreciate your time. And like June said, if you are not part of this conversation, we would have just been miserable three people uh, doing nothing. I have to stop now. Bye for now. So I said it So I will release the people who are online.